So, we had seen the calculations and how to introduce informal proofs instead of the calculations. So, in calculations we found a difficulty in using the deduction theorem and deduction ad absurdum inside the proofs. Okay. So, they had to be uh, put as sub calculations inside a calculation that is what we wanted to avoid though this can be done. Then we introduced informal proofs, but informal proofs also have some limitation like they go only for the consequence relation they do not show equivalence directly. So, if you want to show p if and only if q then you have to show two consequences p entails q and q entails p right. Nonetheless let us use it. So, the fifth one we are discussing last time it is this. So, it is also customary to start one informal proof by first listing all the premises then whenever you want you use them right that is not always followed but it is custom. So, let us try with that say we will have one informal proof in this manner first list all the premises. So, include p as the documentation part. So, these are all the premises So, there ends our premises right then we have to go for the conclusion. Now, when you see that the conclusion is in the form of an implication we are going to use the deduction theorem. So, that means we take its antecedent which is p and r as an extra hypothesis or extra premise and we document it as deduction theorem begins right. So, we start with the seventh line as p and r which we will be writing as deduction theorem begins right. Then our aim is to prove that not of W implies V. So, there is a way here you can start with reduction of absurdum because it is in the not form which you are not going to use it. So, you may start with W implies V in the beginning as another extra premise or there is another alternative you may think of proving this by first proving its equivalence which is w and not v not of w implies v is equivalent to w and not v. So, you may proceed by getting w and then not v then bring it to w and not v then not of w implies v that is one alternative another is use the reduction of absurdum. So, we will start using reduction of absurdum here because we want to show how the nesting is done in the loops in application of this meta theorems. So, let us take W implies V as the uh, next extra premise. So, we say 8 which is W implies V. So, here we have to write reduction ad absurdum begins. Okay. Then what is your strategy? How do you get a contradiction? So, it is starting from P this is also starting from R and we have P and R. So, we start with concluding P from P and R similarly R from P and R then apply these two premises and modus ponens. Okay. So, let us take P this follows from 7. So, you are using P and R entails P that is your elimination law of elimination or if you do not remember the laws there is another alternative, but be aware of bluffing there you may just write T for tautology we know that this is already done right. So, only when you are experienced and you do not want to bluff you can say well I know this as a theorem I do not know what its name is. So, you just write T ok it is really the law of elimination P and R entails P that is what you are using. Then our plan is to use this P 
along with p implies not q and use mode exponents right so that gives you not q from line 1 line 9 and mode exponents even if you don't remember mode exponents so you are allowed write t okay now then what we want to do try to see wherever q appears so it is in the third line not t implies q and you have not q so you can use modus tollens right it will give not of not of t right so that gives not not t by using line 3 3 10 t again modus tollens if you don't remember the name just write t fine so now not not t first let's bring it to t using double negation now you have a nice formula huh? double negation you don't remember so write t okay then what is our plan here there is modus ponens we can use huh? so that will give us not v from line 5 12 modus ponens Okay. Next, how to use not v? Well, you can use here again modus tollens. Yeah. So 14 gives not w, and we are using from 8, 8, 13 modus tollens. Next, can go to this. Okay, so that gives not not u using 6, 14 modus tollens. So let's bring it to better form. So u double negation. Next, we have got u. So again this is appearing here. So, 17 is not s that comes from 4, 16 modus tollens, 2 that gives not r same way, 2, 17 modus tollens. Next, from 7 p and r will give us r that would give us a contradiction. So, you write 19 r that comes from 7 elimination right. We have got r we have got not r therefore, bottom now the problem is this is not complete because you have taken two extra assumptions fine one is p and r another is w implies v so where does that end you have taken one extra assumption here p and r you have also taken another extra assumption w implies v where do they end yes well anywhere you could have ended this requires your premise p and r 7 is being there beyond that there is no 7 so there itself you could have stopped and tell that p and r implies the other things right but it's easier to end it here itself okay so here you may say which one to end first this is the inside loop right so it write r a a e that ends here okay so when that ends here what do you get let's write 21 over the other side so what do we get there 
when you end array array starts with the premise w implies v right so we will be writing w implies v its negation because assuming w implies v gives you a contradiction so its negation must be valid right so we will be writing not of w implies v okay so there only you have to write r a e not here because that is what you are concluding after you see that top is over or bottom you have reached it is unsatisfiable by applying the ra you are obtaining that not of w implies v right so documentation should not be here documentation should be over there we should write r a a e over here instead of on line 20 okay now once you come to r a e that means the conditionality of w implies v that frame is is removed now you don't have this assumption in the proof that's what reductio ad absurdum says fine but still there is another conditionality which is p and r so by deduction theorem you would conclude that w implies v has been obtained its negation has been obtained by assuming p and r so p and r implies negation of that is it clear there you are using the deduction theorem so p and r implies not of w implies v here ends deduction theorem and you can also document the line numbers like you are getting this array due to seventh line uh, sorry eighth line and 19th line right so here you can document as 8 19 array okay 8 and 20 because on 20th only you are getting a contradiction fine similarly for dt you will be getting 21 you are getting as a conclusion and when it starts at 7th one so you document it as 7 20 dt right 21 there ends the proof is it clear okay so let's see the fourth problem that should be easier so that problem says we go for p implies q implies r s implies not p not s and t implies q that should give us t implies r Okay. So, here again your strategy says if you use deduction theorem assume t in for r fine if you want to use reductio ad absurdum you start with not of t implies r that will give you t that will also give you not r right. So, that is same thing as telling n tells t as an extra premise concluding r and after that using the reductio ad absurdum t then not r also and then introduce a or infer one contradiction fine but here it may be possible to get r directly without going to r a so let's see that so we start with the premises first p implies q implies r is a premise s implies not p is a premise not s and t implies q is a premise now comes the extra premise because of deduction theorem. So, we say T deduction theorem begins. Okay. Our aim is to get R. Fine. So, how to get R? We can get if we prove P implies Q. Okay. But how to prove P implies Q? Use deduction theorem assume p 
in for q right so you take another extra hypothesis as p you say deduction theorem again begins but then there is problem so you take one year two year so the loop for deduction theorem 2 should be inside that of 1 that is our idea here fine so now p is an extra premise how do we proceed yes why do we begin with p we want to show r right now we have a premise which says p implies q implies r so if you can prove p implies q by one application of modus ponens it is done now to prove p implies q by deduction theorem i can assume p and deduce q that is what i am doing right so it is a sub proof inside the proof now that is possible because of this looping and nesting okay so now once we assume p what should we do next Yes, we can use this, right? So six gives not s because two five modus tollens, right? So we have not s, we have t, right? So we'll write here. Seventh line gives us not S and T first, not Q directly, right? So that is again introduction. If you have a premise as X, premise as Y, then you can infer X and Y. Okay, that is introduction of and. So we go for not S and T, and that is inferred from lines four and six by law of introduction. So we are free to use t now. Yes, any problem? Okay. Next we, our plan is to use this third one. So we get q from three, seven, and modus ponens. See, our aim was to prove p implies q. We have assumed p in the fifth line. Got q. So first let us go to p implies q, there deduction theorem application or second application will end. So we write 9 as p implies q and document as that premise was introduced in 5 line 5. So 5, 8 deduction theorem ends here, its second instance, is that okay? So by writing this conditionality of p is removed, we have no more assumed p because of deduction theorem. So p implies q is deduced from our premises, fine and possibly the extra assumption dtb1, we do not know that, right. But now we can use all the premises anywhere. So our plan was to use this tenth, so that gives us r that is from line 1 line 9 modus ponens okay is that right okay so you have got r still there is a conditionality here that has not ended okay so that assumption was t therefore we get t implies r Which line was it? Fourth line. So we write 4, 10, and DTE 1. Is it clear? So, advantage is we can read the proof easily, what is happening inside the proof. That is very clear. And you can see the construction also. How we do we proceed thinking towards the proof? that whole third process is decoded or encoded here. Huh? While reading it, you have to decode it. Is it clear? So, 
to these informal proofs and the equivalences or the calculations can be used for many other purposes, not only for proving. See, in usual practical problems, it does not come with symbolization. You have to understand and symbolize it. So, that requires something more, just like your mathematical modeling. Just by knowing some differential equations, you may not be able to solve practical problems. You have to understand what is their meaning, how they are connected and how to model it. The same way, in propositional logic, we are concerned with the connectives. So, you must know what are the meanings of connectives used in the natural languages. Okay? And is used as and, there is no problem. Or is used as or, there is no problem. Implies is used as if then also, if something, then something. So, you have to write it as implies. Sometimes you will write Q provided that P. So, you know it is P implies Q. Okay? Some similar concerns will be required, but there are some connectives which will be difficult to decode. For example, unless. How do you go about it? You say P unless Q. When you say P unless Q, P if not Q. Okay? P if not Q that is your first translation p if not q okay so let's write it that way p if not q so which is simply not q implies p right now what happens if you use the equivalences not q implies p will be equivalent to not of not q or p Right, because we know x implies y is equivalent to not x or y. See, this is true when x is false or y is true. Okay, these are the only cases when this becomes true. So it should be equivalent to not x or y. Right. So now once we apply, you get this, which is simply p or q. So, unless becomes simply R in our language of propositional logic. Now, what about until? Huh? No, see until and unless they are same because there is no time in propositional logic, right? There is no concern for time in propositional logic. So, time is simply omitted and we cannot really correctly symbolize until, because we do not have the concept of time there. So, it will be simply interpreted as unless and that is R. It will not be correct when you apply in the programming scenario. There you have to go for another logic, professional logic is not completely adequate there, but at best which can be done is until will be approximated as unless which will again be symbolized as R. Is it clear? Sometimes in natural languages problems do not come as problems, they will come as stories. Huh? Then you have to decode it correctly. For example, if you have read Merchant of Venice, you would have got nice problems. Have you read? Huh? So, it is a hero in Persia, he says, she says that among all my sweaters, I will choose the one who passes my test. So, the test is this, she takes three caskets, one gold casket, one silver casket, one lead casket. So, in one of the caskets only, she puts her portrait and then locks them. On each of the caskets, she writes one sentence, let us call it inscription. So, now she brings all these three boxes in front of the sweaters and then she declares that you read the inscriptions written on the caskets and I guarantee that it may not be true, the inscriptions may not be true. Now, from that you have to find out where the portrait is. Right? So, now she gives the boxes, on the gold box something is written, let us say the inscription is the portrait is here.
and on the silver casket it is written the portrait is in here. Now, you see all of them cannot be true together right and on the lead casket it is written at least two of the caskets bear false inscriptions. Uh, Okay. Now it's a real logical task. Huh? Something, some solution we found. There may not be solution. We don't know. She might have lied completely. Because she is fond of that. Okay, informally what you can do is start looking at these caskets where the portrait may be, is it consistent, right. So, if you put in the lead casket then what happens, suppose the portrait is in the lead casket. So, this is false, this is false, at least two inscriptions are false, it is consistent, right, it is a possible solution, okay. If you put inside the gold casket, what happens? G is true, S is false. What about L? Hmm? Is true or false? If it is true, if it is true, then at least two of them should have been false, but two of them are becoming true. Therefore, it has to be false. Right. If it is false, then what happens? Two of them are false. At least two of them are false. Is false. So at most one of them can be false. Right. So this is already false. The other one cannot be. Is that okay? So it is not consistent in G. The same way in S also it will not be consistent. It doesn't matter whether G or S. Inscriptions are the same. Okay. So, it is in L because that is the con only consistent one we are finding, but this is the informal one. Now, how to formalize it? The problem is to formalize and prove really. Huh? Okay. Yes, she so declared it and not only at least one of them, it is in one of them. Be there in G, then it should also be in S because they are they know very different. Possible, so but that is no formalization in professional logic, <laughs> <laughs> right? That is correct, that is so how we you want to lead. That is how we want to lead. Okay, let us try, let us try this one. Suppose I write G, capital G for the inscription that is written on the gold bar gold casket. It is the inscription which is written on the gold casket. So, that means, G will be the portrait is in here that sentence itself right as it is written. Then same way I write capital S for the inscription written on the silver casket. So, it is this. Okay. So, in fact, when you say in here, here is really confusing. So, you have to change the inscription this way when you interpret, we have to say that the portrait is in the gold casket right, not only here that is the that is the inscription that is the way we have to read G right. So, G becomes the portrait is in gold casket. Similarly, S stands for capital S stands for the portrait is in silver casket. Okay. Capital L stands for the inscription on the lead which is this itself. Fine. Let us introduce some more propositional variables small g. What should be small g? For something else I am writing related to the gold cascade. Not g. Huh? 
See, one is the inscription you are writing. The portrait is in gold casket. That is the inscription. But where is the portrait? You don't know. That may be true or false. It is given. So let's write small g means the portrait is in gold casket. Right? It is not the inscription. Where is the portrait? For that we are symbolizing. Okay. So this g is this inscription itself. Let me write a quote for that. Okay. So now small g will be the portrait is in gold casket. Right. So capital G is for the inscription written on the gold casket. Small g is for the portrait is in the gold casket. Okay. Now small s for the portrait is in silver casket. Next small l for the portrait is in lead casket. Fine. Now these are all propositional variables. Now what are the premises given? Yes. It is in one of the caskets. Exactly in one of the caskets. And I mean G and S. G and L and S and L are. Or S or L. G S. Not of G and S. If it is in one of them, it is not in the others. Yeah. Right. So let's try. G implies not S and not L. Okay. Similarly, S implies not G and not L. Is that okay? Next, L implies not G and not S. It is in exactly one of the caskets. Next, what are the other premises? Yeah, capital L implies not G. Capital L. If L is true, then at least two of them we are false inscriptions. That is true. Fine. So that means G has to be false. The other inscription G has to be false. The other inscription S has to be false. So this says not G and not S. If L is false. Then so it says at most one of the inscriptions can be false. Already L is false, therefore other two must be true. Is that okay? G and S. Any other premise? Uh, capital G implies small G. Capital S implies small G. Why implies? If and only. Oh, okay. Huh? Suppose the inscription which is written on gold casket is true, that means the portrait is in here is true. So small g is true, and conversely, right? So we have g if and only if small g, s if and only if small s. Okay, and our hypothesis is, our guess is, it should give us. This is consistent. That's what we have found out by informal arguments. We have to show that really it entails L. Okay, Persia is not irrational. Is that okay? Now, how to go about it? How to prove this? There are so many, but so many may not be relevant. So, first thing is look at this: capital G, small g, capital S, small s. So, these two are premises. We don't need to consider all those capitals and smalls. Is that okay for G and S? So instead of this capital G and S, we could have taken small G and S also. That is our first observation. Okay. Where else? Here also we could have taken. 
but we are not able to think about l and small l right is it we do not know it doesn't say the portrait is in here it says something else right those two we could do because they are the same sentences here but for l sentences are different fine so let's do that first so once we do it instead of this one we would have gone for g and s then instead of this we would have gone for not g and not s we don't need the last two now it's done huh? okay now how do we prove l from this where from should we start so once you want to prove small l where from it will follow you have to check that where from it will follow small l Huh? G, G and S, G and S will give what? Not G and not S. Not of G and S will give. Not. Not of G and S. Not of G and S. Is where? Here. That will give capital L. G or from this place? Huh? Can you get G or S? But G or S, see this is not of G or S. De Morgan. So if you say G or S, then it will say not L. Right by contraposition. So you have to see that that doesn't happen, right? No. Now you go back. So once it is in L, it is not in G, and it is not in S. But if it is not in G, it is not in S. Then where is it? It is also in L, right? So you should have. is it okay this is what you have missed of course it will follow from this once you have this that will also follow similar way you could have got your stronger premises fine so now to prove l you simply go for not g and not s if you can show that that is enough now to give not g and not s somewhere here or here Where to so? Which extra premise? Not L, not of capital L. Show that it's a conflict. Not of L. Okay. So suppose we start with not L. Then we get G and S. Right. Then. G and S gives what? Yes, but uh, that cannot be possible. It gives not small g. Well. Give g gives not g s. Mm -hmm. so no, g and s. This uh, argument is g and s is not possible. Yeah, g and s gives not s. Not s. <coughs> Where it is not possible, we have shown. Uh, g implies not s. I am not there. So g no, you have g and s. He says it is not possible. Uh. That is clear from the context also. Is it formalized anywhere? G and S will give not L, not small L. G and S will give not small L. G or S, right? By modus ponens, it will give us not L. 
this not L. Then? So, not G and not L. No, do not use that. You go the other way. Not L gives G and S. Right? Now, G and S gives? Not L. Uh, small small s itself. S. So it's uh, called G, G and S gives not S. Not S. How? Yeah. Oh? G, G, G is not S. S. Not S. G implies not S and not S. So? So, so, so not, not S and S are so not, not L is not, not possible by R A. That gives the contradiction. Is it okay? So it is L. Is it okay? No. So now where should we start? Okay. Not L. So, deduction theorem begins <coughs> or you want to put array, which one you want? Array, array you want? Yeah. Okay, let us try. So, you have R A begins. Next, we have introduced the premise not L implies G and S. Okay, that is a premise. So, you get G and S by mode exponents. Next. Next. Use this. Huh? So, fourth one is you need g from this. So, 3 and tautology which is elimination. Now, fifth is introduce that premise g if and only if not s and not l it is a premise. Okay. You want to infer not S and not L from line 5. Okay. But not only line 5, you have to use G also there, right. So, you write 4 also. That is really mode exponents because G if and only if not s and not l will give you g implies not s and not l right so it is mode exponents now from this you get not s elimination then this one gives g and s that gives s so 8 s 3 elimination Okay, that gives what? Bottom hmm? seven eight and this comes because of our extra assumption, therefore L you take one ten R A ends. Now you have L. Next L implies this, then it should give this, right. So, 11 L implies not G and not S, that is a premise, 12 not G and not S from 10, 11 mode exponents, ok. Next, that is a premise. Next, L. It is really mode exponents. Fine. So equivalences can be used also for many other purposes. So one of them, uh, let's see how to bring some propositions to nicer form. From where we can guess better things. Okay. So, let us see one example, how does it go. Suppose I write one proposition in this form, suppose I take this proposition. Now, can you tell me what are its models? See, a model means you are searching for one interpretation which makes the proposition true, right? 
it becomes one. Now, it is an or proposition, everything is odd together. So, this becomes one when any one of them is one, right. So, one avenue will give you this as one, another possibility one, another possibility this as one. Now, this is one aunt proposition, it is a conjunction of many. So, this can be one when all of them are one, right. So, now we have three possibilities. So, one possibility says P must be 1 and Q must be 1. In that case, the proposition becomes 1. And the other possibility is when not Q is 1, R is 1. So, we say Q is 0 and R is 1. Okay? And there is another possibility when P is 1 and not S is 1. Okay. So, these are the three possibilities you get looking at the proposition itself and there is no other possibility when it becomes 1, is that clear? Because it is R, fine. Now, from this of course, you can find out so many others like you have now four propositional variables involved, but you have considered only two propositional variables. So, other two are free. So, free means they can be either 0 or 1 does not matter still this will be a model, right. So, there will be four possibilities here. When you give R as 1 or 0, S as 1 or 0. Similarly, here there are again four possibilities. Here also there are four possibilities, right. Yes. So, you get all the models directly looking at the proposition. Okay. So, this is certainly a nicer form to get. Yes. This we cannot get the number of no, you have to go further, right. You have to go further finding out all the possibilities that will give you the number of models, fine. Now, suppose I change the ors and aunts here. Now, I consider P or Q and not Q or R and P or not S, keep everything else as it is. The same way you can find the non models of this, just think about it. 